So as you sit here, level one, any regrets? Oh, no. I mean, because I, I'd like to think the results of all New Zealanders' hard work speak for themselves. Um, there will, of course, be things that all of us have learned along the way, and that will stand us in good stead as we go forward. So if we had a Royal Commission right here, right now, you wouldn't do anything different? Oh, again, of course, there's always things you'd reflect on, Mike, but with the information we have, you know, I think actually we've done really well as a nation. Uh, and, and I do think the results speak for themselves. We're not done yet, though, and as you've just said, we now need to imply, and I'd like to think that we have, the same rigour to our health response, to our economic response. I'll come back to that in just a moment. The Trans-Tasman Safe Border Group mm. gave you their report. You've read it, I take it. What's holding us up? Yes. Uh, essentially, we need to make sure that Australia is in a similar position to us. They aren't yet. Um, uh, New South Wales, um, Victoria, Victoria in particular, still seeing cases come through. I think they've had over, from memory, 170 cases of community transmission. So just getting getting them in the spot where they're ready. Uh, and so it's as much down to them as it is down to us. So, so what's like the criteria? Is it your criteria that they need to be exactly the way we are, or is uh, it Morrison's criteria no, that he feels confident he can go? A joint, it'll be a joint decision, um, but we will set some parameters around what our expectations because we need to set up a framework. Australia now, of course, uh, the Pacific are interested as well. Yeah. So we need a framework that can apply more broadly. What literally um, are our requirements then, literally? Zero cases? Something, uh, no, no, not necessarily. Keeping in mind, if we had five cases at our border, we wouldn't want that counting against us, but they would be in quarantine. So we do need we do need a framework that allows and factors in uh, what will be uh, ongoing management of cases. We're working through that framework at the moment, um, as, as I've said, uh, getting everything in place for the time and place where we're ready to go. But it's not a case, Mike, of New Zealand sitting here and saying no to Australia. Australia is not saying they're ready yet either. Okay. Are, are, they, are they talking statewide, or you mentioned Victoria, for example, would we go just New South Wales or do we need to wait for all of Australia? No, Morrison's actually, uh, the Prime Minister's actually left that open. Um, we've said that's a matter for Australia. It's not, we, we're okay. not necessarily here determining that it has to be uh, countrywide, and they have very deliberately left the option of opening up individual states. So could it mean the Pacific come first in that case, given they don't have any? Well, um, of course, uh, you know, that's been the case uh, for the Cook Islands and Niue, realm countries. Um, we're, we're working on a framework that will uh, basically cater for uh, either of those scenarios, but we have focused on trans -tasking. But how long? When? I mean, what's, where... what's stopping a plane leaving for Fiji right now? Oh, Fiji, different. They have had cases. Yeah, but they've gone. Uh, and so... <laughs> Again, you do want to make sure that you're looking at that relative number relative to their testing. Their testing has been lower, Mike, so we do need to make sure we apply a bit of rigour to that judgement. OK, over what time are we applying the rigour and when do the planes leave? So, first of all, Mike, we're focusing on trans-Tasman bubble first. Huge um, uh, number of reasons why for that, not least um, tourism uh, not going one way for us, but also uh, New Zealand's closer economic relationship with Australia. So we put that in a special category. We are working on a framework, though, that can apply more broadly. I haven't put out a time frame because COVID hasn't had a time frame. We are using the data that's coming through from those nations around their cases, transmission, testing levels, uh, and that is the basis on which we'll make those decisions. We're focusing on Australia first. OK. New Zealand Initiative were also on the programme this week, and they've been in your ear for the last couple of weeks, they claim. They say, let's leverage our health gains here. There are ski teams who want to come into the country, and they want to train for things like the Olympics. They want to get some students back, stuff like that. They're frustrated, they say you're not listening. Why not? Uh, on what basis do they claim we're not listening? Well, they've been talking uh, to you and you they say have... you're not listening. Well, <laughs> I guess that's all subjective, Mike. You will have seen, we do have an exemptions regime, but you have to, keeping in mind that whilst we've you know, set some criteria where people are coming through where they can demonstrate that actually it's necessary for New Zealand's um, at certain industries where we basically couldn't operate without them being in New Zealand. At the same time, Mike, we've got limited quarantine capacity and I also need to allow New Zealanders to come back and their family to come back. 
So we've got roughly 3,500 people we can cater for in quarantine at a time, and that's um, we've got to make sure that we're getting that mixture of both, but predominantly we're focusing on getting those. But we're full, in reasons. other words. What you're saying is we're, we've got quarantine capacity and we're, we're filling running, it up with as much as we possibly can. We're running pretty much at capacity, yes. So the next steps for us are can we expand that? Are there things we could do to support export education coming in? Um, making sure we've got that economic criteria right is really important too. Um, but I'd say we are working through all of those issues, Mike, but capacity is one issue. Borders are our biggest vulnerability, so we do need to make mm. sure that they're nice and tight. Just clear this up for me, a lot of interest in the, the business yesterday of no new cases. When did you find out? Uh, yes, uh, Sunday So it was Sunday. Afternoon. So that was, was why Sunday. you were at home dancing with your daughter? Yes, <laughs> correct. It okay. was Sunday and I was at home. You are not at home during the week dancing with your daughter, or you are? No, I am not. I didn't realise there was confusion over this. Yeah, I there re- is much as confusion, was, believe me. As, as was announced, those results came in the day prior. The first opportunity to announce them was at 1pm on Monday. Okay. Uh, the, if there's, even then, Mike, um, I work on Sunday as well. That's the day I do my oh, I'm, no, I'm not criticising so you. It's just a lot of people saying you're dancing at home with your daughter on a Monday. That's all. Um, as far <laughs> no, as in, no. in New Zealand... Should they credit or should they give cash to customers and are you worried as the major shareholder? Well, as a major shareholder, we want to make sure that customers are being looked after and that does mean that the communication most certainly could have been um, vastly improved. That's something that um, Minister Farfoy has said several times. Um, but equally, Air New Zealand has also acknowledged that they would be in a difficult position if they were refunding um, all non-flexible fares. Um, but they've also apologised for some of um, the management of the issue as well. So, so communication aside, think, they're doing the right thing as far as you're concerned? Well, we are, we are looking at whether or not we need to bring into alignment some of uh, our legislation in alignment with some of the regulation that sits within the EU and the US, but that wouldn't be retrospective anyway. So that's a piece of work we're going to do down the track. Should they have done do something differently that, then is what you're suggesting? Oh, well, it, it is difficult. Some of these fears, of course, um, uh, were not flexi fears and were non-refundable. But at the same time, uh, obviously, when you're a consumer, you're not buying thinking that there's going to be a circumstance where your, your ticket would just be cancelled because of a global pandemic and people were not being able to fly. So a range of tricky issues in there. I do think New Zealand could have handled it better. They do need to keep working through individual circumstances because we do have cases of people who need to rebook quite quickly. So I just encourage them to keep working through that and prioritising people who need to get back home. So where do you sit with Kiwi Rail then? Fletcher's and Downers are furious. $371 million contract that's gone offshore. What happened to supporting local business? Well, a couple of things to remember there. So where it has gone uh, is a company with a 50-year record on New Zealand. So they've part of McDonnell and Dow. Um, keeping in mind, we're, of course, quite focused on who's going to be put in work through these contracts right now, regardless of where that contract is going. And yes, I'm disappointed that we'll see some profits go offshore, but regardless of where that contract is going, it's going to be Kiwis on the job, not least because there's no other alternative right now. So that is important to us. So the buy New Zealand thing is like working from home things, sort of never really going to happen. It was a nice no, idea I mean, in lockdown, but here we are back no, in the real world. Like, Mike, you would be the first to Oh, I agree. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying we said a lot of stuff me. in lockdown that none of it seems to be happening. No, I would, I would refute that. Look, we, we have an obligation to make sure that we follow a proper tender process. We also have obligations to make sure that we follow our international trade obligations, right? So, of course, we want to see New Zealand companies succeeding and supported. At the same time, the point I'm making here is McDonald Dow has been working here for a very long time and have experience in electrification. Whilst I'm disappointed, yes, that there's a chance here we're going to see some profits go offshore, we will see a New Zealand employment out of it because they have no choice right now. Is Sergey and Yulia in the country? I'm going to say the same thing I said yesterday. Uh, I don't want to set a precedent where I'm commenting on every single potential person that may or may not be in the country. But what I will say is you shouldn't believe everything that you read. Would you know? Uh, yes. Do you know? If I, I'm not going, again, Mike, I'm not going to get into a situation where I comment on every single person that may or may no, not I'm be in the country. No, I'm asking about every single person. With, Just immigration. Uh, 
Immigration said they had no record. So if they have no record, would you have a record? And would their record be separate for your record than their record? And I'm going to give you the same answer that I gave at the beginning, that whilst I'm not going to confirm or deny, I am going to say that you shouldn't believe everything that you read. Are you at all worried about the Drug Foundation and their running of this campaign at the moment to the tune of many hundreds, if not millions of dollars, seemingly unchecked and funded by we don't know because there are no rules around how you run these things? Well, no, there are rules around our contracts, though, so I think that's important. So uh, Yeah, but that's well, public money, not... but the money they're spending from donations, we know not where that money comes from, how much it is and who gave it, and there are no rules around it. Well, of course, they are funded through uh, donations, grants from their members, corporate and private, um, and so, you know, ultimately they're answerable then to those individuals. When it comes to government um, grants and funding, they are, of course, answerable to deliver on those contracts. So that money is not being used for this purpose. No, of course. But we have a system in this country where they can go out seemingly and receive millions of dollars from Lord knows who and just spend that money trying to twist people's arms on what is a very important social issue and a referendum, and there are no rules around it. How can we operate that way? Well, they do. They are registered under the Charities Act. No, no, no. The amount of money they can get. They can go out tomorrow and get $100 million from anybody and spend that money, and we never know who that money came from or who they are. Yeah, but ultimately, ultimately, they have to be responsible for saying that they are the ones behind advertising. It is then they are then answerable to their own donors as to what they're doing. Why are they answerable to the public whose arms they're trying to twist? Oh, well, ultimately, um, Mike, I have a little more faith in New Zealanders. Well, of then, if you do, they're... why don't you run political parties that way and they can get as much money from whoever they like and they don't have to tell us either? Well, we do have obligations. We are campaigning for individuals to vote for us and we do have obligations to declare but our Why are your obligations different to their obligations? Because, because, Mike, we're in power. And when you're in power, you have to demonstrate where your funding streams are so that people can have transparency over whether you're not making decisions because of anyone's influence. The Drug Foundation are not in power. So, they don't have the ability to make decisions. What they do, what they are doing, is running you know, their perspective uh, on a uh, referendum on cannabis use, and they have an interest in that area, so that won't be surprising to most people. Appreciate your time very much. People.